I try to use analogies of like houses or something relatable for people to understand. Just like you mentioned, when you start a new store now, it's, hey, let's enable HPOS from the get go. If you're building a house and you know how that house should be built for the purposes that house is going to have. And it's going to be your family house, like for the next 40 years or 50 years, right? Oh, yeah. So you're going to make sure there's space for the pool, the playground or fire pit, whatever stuff your family likes to do. You're going to account for all of that ahead of time. You're not going to just buy a plot of land and mm. start building away here. Hey, Bob WP here and welcome to Woo Dev Chat. A do the Woo podcast show. Woo! Woo! This show is brought to you by Avalero. We want to help developers make sure their Woo projects are tax compliance and done right with Avalero's API. In today's show, I'm excited to introduce you to our new co-host for Woo Dev Chat. Meet Marcel Schmitz and Mike Andreessen. Marcel runs PluginLab.com, a small agency dedicated to creating and managing products and services for WooCommerce, and Mike, who is founder of WP Bullet, where he does WordPress and WooCommerce performance optimizations. They are both WordPress experts at Codable, and I'm guessing they use their developer skills in other projects across our space as well. Each month, in addition to Carl and Zach's series, you will hear them have conversations between themselves and with the guests. Today, they dive into WooCommerce's high-performance order storage, or as you can call it, HPOS or HPOS, whichever you prefer. So let's join into the conversation. Well, hello, Mike. How are you? Hey, Marcel. How are you doing today? I'm good. How's the weather over there? You in 200 meters from here? Uh, well, we have sunshine. There is no wind at the moment, not rain, no rain at all. And it feels like May in Porto, spring. Finally, right? Yeah, no more rain. So, um, yeah, what have you been up to lately? Tell me about what you've been working on. Well, I have a few clients um, on WooCommerce who have been migrating and testing the HPOS update or HPOS. Oh, Okay. And a lot of them are a bit confused. They are expecting huge performance improvements, and some are seeing some, and others are not seeing what they expected to. And so I'm trying to help them figure out what's going on and also doing a lot of cleanup afterwards to help you know, improve the health of the database, cleaning up the post table, post meta, that kind of stuff, whatever. Seeing what can be removed without breaking stuff, you know, that's always the fun part of what we do. So that's funny because I've been working as well with um, that lately, and I have been working with some rather small databases where the uh, performance is probably not that much important or not that much visible when we do the migration. But there's another one, a big one, that um, it's reducing a lot of database size and also the performance in the backend operation primarily because they do operate with a lot of third-party um, people that access order data, and they're seeing huge advantage. But before we go into deeply into whatever we do, um, I think we first must with we have to agree on is it HPOS HPOS how are we going to call this thing? <laughs> I'm good with whatever I've always I've never heard it said out loud until recently exactly. so I've I've always just read the abbreviation in my head I think HPOS lets us move faster instead of HPOS there's more pauses so let's let's HPOS it I think especially especially for me as a foreigner and uh, yeah, HPOS is it's a mouthful for me. So HPOS, I think it's a good compromise. Sounds good. HPOS. Okay. So maybe we go ahead and explain a little bit what HPOS is because it's been around for years, I would say. And um, maybe it's a little it's important for us to let everyone know. Well, people listening in probably might already know. Um, HPOS is just basically a new database uh, table collection that WooCommerce introduced that will allow. Uh, shop owners to um, yeah migrate the data that they have for their orders that uh, were and are still living into posts and post meta and just talking about having orders stored in a table uh, called um, WP posts is like already a little bit scary right like 
Okay, that's fine. And then we have the post meta, which collects all the information about the order. Um, and yeah, that's an issue, right, Mike? Why, why is that an issue? It's an issue because, you know, po the post, people forget WordPress was designed to be a CMS, right? It was designed for blog posts and pages, and then it blew up in popularity and people wanted to start using it for all kinds of things. Right? So I have a blog, but I also want to have a store. Or I also want to have a forum. And then they sort of tried to use the existing database structure, which um, meant everything went in the post table and post meta. And the poor post meta table is probably along with the options table is the most abused or overused um, tables uh, in, in WordPress. And so it's good to give them a break and let them be used for what they were originally intended for, I think as much as possible, because what can happen is, you know, the queries that when you're doing queries for orders, it's going to, it's, it's, it's taking up information in the post and post meta. If you do queries for something simple, like a blog post or uh, something else that is in those tables, then it's going to be slow because of something that's not related to that. Right. And in the performance world, Right. Don't like things to be slow because of something they're not responsible for whenever possible. And and we do have only two tables to collect a bunch of information about orders, right? We we are collecting a billing addresses, shipping addresses, we're collecting um order data, item metadata. So it's a bunch of information that gets per order, we get a bunch of 20, 30 lines, maybe less, maybe more, depending also on the plugins that you have installed. So for each order that is stored on uh, WP Post, we get um, dozens of uh, entries in Post Meta, right? And that's an issue because uh, for a WooCommerce websites, it's an e-commerce. They want to sell as much as possible. That means uh, as many orders as possible. And the more orders we get on this system, um, the slower the performance of the database will get because we get potentially, not potentially, we will get definitely millions and millions of records within Post Meta. And not only the information about uh, WooCommerce that is stored there is compromised or slower, it's the whole site, right? So everything that has to do with querying post meta, I cannot recall anything that doesn't go to post meta unless you're working with settings, which is not the uh, front end facing part of the WordPress. It's, it's always querying post meta. So there's always something going on over there. And, and that's an issue and that makes the site slow, very slow, right? Yeah. And it can lead to, you know, when databases grow too large beyond the hosting capacity that the RAM, um, you know, th you start to get 502 bad gateways or, you know, miscellaneous Cloudflare errors, things timing out, employees getting frustrated. They have to, you know, wait a couple of minutes to do a simple search or uh, customers who are trying to check out for the first time. And they're like, I'm clicking the buttons and why aren't things moving? You know, the, these long delays, they just, it costs so much more in, than just money to, to people, you know, new conversions, your brand, your reputation, you know, what I tell clients is you're, you're showing your technical sophistication, right? So if things are not flowing well, um, from a performance standpoint, then it makes you look like you don't know what you're doing, which is not good for your, your overall image and stuff. Right. So, and then there's, you know, backup size too. Like we forget that this stuff has to be, you know, you want to have backups. So you have to do a database dump every day at least and store that somewhere. And uh, that takes up space. So the larger your database is, the more you might have to pay for hosting. And if in the event of an emergency, you know, restoring a 10 gigabit database takes time, right? So if it was half that size, you know, you're going to be back up and running significantly faster, right? So there's just so many benefits to to moving to something more streamlined in terms of database structure, especially for something as complicated as uh, an e-commerce solution that's going to live inside of, of WordPress. So it's really cool there. This finally got pushed forward. Yeah. And, and we know that speed equals more sales when we talk about e-commerce. And there's numbers that, can, um, that we can present to clients that show that. And so that's really attractive for um, especially stores that are competing with bigger ones. And if they happen to be, let's say, double as fast, that's not a difficult number to get in now nowadays when you're competing with other websites. If they get double as fast as their competition, 
clients will notice that and they will probably come back to your store. And it's an overall much more pleasant experience if you're browsing through a catalog that is bullet fast and um, just working. I know we were talking about specifically the um, orders um, information that is getting stored in a custom table or multiple custom tables. We're going to talk about those in a bit. Uh, but it's also, like I said before, post meta, right? It's it's everything else. So also accessing information about, yeah, just every single page, right? And so if you have a faster website, you have more sales. Um, and cost here is not that important. And it's not that difficult to migrate, or is it difficult to migrate to HBOs? What does your experience so far tell us? So I typically work with larger stores, or at least stores that are more complicated. So, you know, we're talking databases that are 10 gigabytes, 15 gigabytes, they're significantly large. So trying to do the migration inside of the the browser, you know, it's relying on action scheduler firing and all this other stuff through those requests. And CLI is always my preferred um, method of working when it comes to this kind of thing, because the, those timeouts that exist in PHP FPM for you know the, the front facing don't exist in CLI. It's usually set to negative one or zero, whatever it might be. And then you can use screen right to create a, a session so that even if your laptop goes off, you know it still um, keeps running in the background. And you can use um, you know the skip plugins flag with WP CLI. So there's a certain plugin that you know doesn't matter for the processing of, of the the data for the migration or other tasks, but you know, it's still WordPress is still executing because it thinks it needs to, um, you can skip that. There's just gives you so much more flexibility and power working through the, the CLI. So I think if you document things well, you know, I think we both use notion, right? So you can make pretty documentation. That's really easy to follow with the code blocks and this and that and put our links in for the documentation that we find. And then you can paste errors and, you know, it, with the little collapse thingies to make it um, not take up too much space. So I think it's, it's easy if you know how, right? That's, it's a good, it's a good quote in general. Um, but it takes a, a lot of exploration, I think in the beginning for professionals like us that because we really want to make sure what we're communicating to the clients is accurate and represents reality. Right. And there's a lot of, um, yeah, testing we sort of do to make sure that. Right. Correct. So what about your experience? Is that, do, do you find something similar or? Right. So the little store client was more about the client coming to me and saying, hey, I have heard about this HBOS thing with WooCommerce. It's supposed to increase my website speed and it's a better way to store. I just heard good things about it and I want it in my website. And um, so that was it. And And when we're talking about small clients and small stores, usually those are made uh, almost 100% by the store owner. So they set up commerce, they choose the plugins, they install the theme, they configure everything around. So there's no, most of the cases, there's no technical background and they just go with tutorials and information they find online and they just start building their website, right? And then it suddenly becomes a successful business. They have sales, they have people coming in, they have um, more products that they want to display. And it eventually comes to a point where they need professional help, right? And sometimes it's easier things like changing plugins behaviors or adding features to the existing plugins. Sometimes it's performance. It's, it, yesterday it was running fast. Today it's not opening at all. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff. And lately I have been having other clients coming in saying, I heard about HBOS and, and how can I, can I press here this button and activate it? It says here it has... It is not compatible with 44 plugins that I have installed. I'm just exaggerating a little bit, but we, we do have websites that have like on the 40, 50, 60 plugins installed in this kind of clients where they do everything by themselves. And and there's nothing wrong with that, but there's there's compromises when it comes to installing so many plugins. So when activating HBOS, it's going to tell you which plugins are not compatible, but there are two ways we're going to do this. And this this first client that I had had a bunch of, dozens of plugins and we had two situations one was there were plugins that were not declaring that they were compatible with hbos which you as a plugin author should 
definitely look out for and and specifically and explicitly say you're compatible with HBOS. And there are other ones who will be scanned by WooCommerce um, and show as potentially un- incompatible with uh, with uh, HBOS. And so there are different modes when you activate HBOS, right? So there's the legacy mode. Uh, there is the, the the pure mode, let's call it like that, and um, um, there's also one that allows you to go back to to the previous uh, version. And um, so the uh, the the decision here is eventually how what can I do with these plugins, right? So what can I just uninstall them? Uh, can I contact the authors? So basically, most of the clients that it was that were not able to migrate to HPOS right now were because plugin authors didn't support this correctly. And uh, that has been my experience so far. So I had a bunch of clients coming in asking for this and me having to explain sometimes uh, in during non-paid hours uh, why it's not compatible. Um, and sometimes, and yeah, just two cases right now, one small and one very, very big where they said, yeah, yeah we know about this. We know you need time for discovery to just go through all the plugins list and make sure that they are compatible. That's super important. And also uh, to make sure that you rehearse this migration or that you do uh, testing before you actually commit to the client and go and say, yes, we can migrate successfully. Uh, I'll make sure that works. So um, I don't know about you, but I feel like you cannot say to the client, we will do this for sure. Stay rest. Just, Go back to your things, sell your products, and when you come back in two weeks, three weeks, eight weeks, it's going to be uh, migrated to HBOTs. That doesn't work like that, right? No, like I think in general, especially with performance related work too, like whenever clients are looking for guarantees in terms of specific numbers or specific outcomes, um, I usually say, like, look, tech stuff is complicated, and I guarantee you I'll do my best. And I will give you my best efforts and be as thorough as humanly possible and, you know, be very honest and transparent throughout the whole process. And then the the hope is to get you all of the outcomes that you want, but trying to guarantee that I think is dangerous in general when it comes to tech, because there are just so many unknowns, especially when it's uncharted territory with something so new um, like this, that's finally getting put into production servers. Like there's going to be a lot of, quirks that were perhaps unanticipated you know so yeah i think it's safer to say you know i think clients really appreciate when you're just honest and upfront with them and say look we're going to try and do this and if they're in if they've been in the e-commerce um, world for long enough they sort of know that's just how things go right and this is a this is a, this is a big one right so um it's good practice for them to get used to how this process goes if they haven't tried something like this before. It's a big one. And we, we kind of forget that we're dealing with huge databases in your case. And in my last client case, it's it's around 8 million records in the post meta and 6, six million or 7 million of them are related to orders. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong, right? It's not like a switch a button, you wait for some uh, action scheduler to run any actions and it's, it's done. And like you said, you could do that, right? So you could rely on PHP to do all the conversion. PHP was never meant to be a long-running task at all. It was meant to be the fastest I can get my work done, the better kind of uh, <laughs> scripting language. So it, obviously CLI comes to rescue here, and, and WP CLI has um, all the tools that you need to do the migration and to do the cleanup, which we're going to talk also a little bit about. But let's, let's maybe just start about... Um, explain a little bit what uh, HBOS does in the background, uh, what it is, and uh, how it works. Maybe maybe I'll go ahead and start. Um, yeah, we talked about posts and post meta. And we also talked about how big those um, um, tables can get. So what HBOS does, it, it creates a bunch of new tables to store order information, right? And it used to be, I'm, I'm always using the past tense here because I'm Every single WordPress uh, WooCommerce project that I'm going to take on right now, I'm just going to start by saying let's let's just switch to HBoss, right? It's you want a new plugin, you want this, you want this, okay? But he- hear me out. There's a, this HBoss thing that we 
um, should highly encourage people to adopt and to change. And let's let's just start with that. And and if the store is small enough, then it shouldn't be a big of a deal, and it should be possible, right? But so HPOS creates this number of different tables. And instead of having 30, 40 lines with different information about the order, we now have different tables and each of that specific information has its own column. So we can query about sales data, about uh, customer data, about items that belong to the order. All of that is nicely organized into different tables. And that just makes it a lot easier for uh, data to be uh, queried and, and first to collect data, right? Yeah, and uh, so the number one reason that I found out why plugins are not incompatible is um, they they do get the post meta meta directly using the get post meta function from WordPress, right? And that's uh, ten years ago that would be fine, or eight years, or how many years at the beginning, because there were no other ways to get information, but. Uh, there is the get meta function when you instance an order with WC get order, and that's the correct way to use it. And the way that this is done is no matter which mode you're on, legacy or off or on or whatever, uh, it's going to always work with get meta. And that's the safest way to go. And so my experience was when I was looking into plugins and trying to figure out why they're not compatible, either they're making direct queries to the database and using the post meta table, which um, is the worst way to, to go about it. Worst way, but also probably the fastest way. But well, for, in this case, it is. Well, let's consider it worse because we're hoping that every plugin author out there that works with e-commerce is wanting to help customers getting their stores updated and into the latest technology. So they should push towards uh, HBOS as well. And uh, that's that's the number one difficulty I've, I'm seeing. But you t- you told me the other day that you had difficulties with uh, the cleanup, and, and let's maybe just start by explaining what cleanup is. Yeah, so we talked about this on our way to squash, actually, right last week. Right, and you were telling me how the the legacy table, like the legacy mode, means that it's a copy like of all of the orders and metadata is still saved in the post and post meta table when that mode is enabled. And a lot of uh, the, the two clients that I was working with, or that I am still working with, one of them um, still has legacy mode enabled. And she does, uh, she does, a, she has a freebie style um, WooCommerce solution. So she gives a lot away, but people cre- end up creating an account, there's orders and all of those things go into to, to the tables, right? So her database is, I think, 15 gigs large or something and um when i after you you told me that i started digging in and she still has all of the shop you know the shop order uh post types in uh in the post table which i learned still need to stay there for like even if you do the full hpos migration if you had if you if you came from like like the older site you still need to keep them um but her post meta she had over a million, 1.5 million, something crazy like that. And um, she didn't know that, right? And so she's um, her, she's like a, a lower budget client in general. So she wants to, her site was crashing because she's running out of RAM for the, the database to be functioning and, um, you know, paying more money for hosting because you're, customers quote unquote right who aren't giving you any money or taking up space in the database costing you it doesn't really make business sense so a couple of years ago i did a cleanup for her to delete all of the customers that aren't giving her any money and we saved a, a few gigabytes there but now with this cleanup we're going to reduce the database by half um, by getting rid of the, the legacy data at least in post meta we're gonna i told her we'll, we'll keep the the shop orders that will turn into shop order placehold um, in the meantime, and then we'll set something in the future for in a year or two to to clean it up. So, and there are the these tools that um, WooCommerce have provided to do the de- deletion for you, um, and it lets you run things in batches, which is really cool. So you can do like a batch size. I did a thousand for for her because she had I think forty seven thousand or some ins- crazy. Oh, that was the number of customers. But anyway. She had a lot to delete, and that's why CLI is so powerful, right? You just sort of like 
I ran it in a screen and then just let it uh, run for the, it only took about an hour or so too, which was mm-hmm. pretty mm-hmm. impressive, I thought. And it was spitting out some errors, which I think I screenshotted and sent to you. Um, and I was like, oh, maybe it's not actually doing anything. But I, I used CLI to check the database size and do the order by to show the biggest tables. And her post meta still went from, it was 10 gigabytes down to um, less than six, I think. So I was like, oh, it's actually like, even though I'm getting these errors from the tool, it still is clearly working. So there's probably some minor bug or whatever. So um, yeah, that's that's how the cleanup is going for on her site. And I've been doing, I think I've done three tests over the weekend, right? Like when I did one one test cleaning up the users with no orders, when you run the WooCommerce customer delete function in, the, in CLI, uh, you have to specify a user to run the command as, right? And that has to be an admin user. And I was using her admin ID and she doesn't have any orders. So guess what happened during the, the script? <laughs> Right. I think it was like halfway through, I started getting errors, and I was like, oh, like I, I deleted the person who was executing the orders from the CLI's perspective. So those are the kind of quirks, right, that can emerge when we're um, doing large-scale migrations like this, that you're like, oh, that was an, ex-, you know, I didn't think of her as a customer, right, because she doesn't have the customer role, but she still has um, total spent is zero in the, the database, right? So she got flagged as someone not giving, <laughs> not spending any money, right? Which is which is also accurate. So I added some clauses to skip ad administrators and if it, the user ID equals her to not execute it, right? So it's fun. You know, this is the, the kind of cool stuff we get to do. And, and also, okay, so maybe we should go back a little bit and explain. So there's, there's the legacy mode, which basically means we're going to keep doing whatever we do, which is storing order information in posts and post meta. There is the high performance order storage mode, which is the one that we're talking about with new tables and any information being saved elsewhere. So when we're talking about uh, activating this mode, we're talking about there's a first step that gets all the information from the orders from the posts and post meta and stores it into this new uh, tables that are created for this HPOS environment. And then you can actually decide two things, either enable comp- compatibility mode, which will synchronize the information between both tables or both systems, which is the one that our clients do not want because we're actually increasing the database size and not diminishing. And, and then there's another one which disables the compatibility mode, which makes us have to be 100% compatible with this mode. Means that, and when, and when I say we, we as taking care of, uh, as the, the expert taking care of the client's website, we have to make sure that the plugins are all compatible. And sometimes we don't have that. And sometimes we do get into uh, plugins and we do maybe extensions to those plugins to fix some of the errors if we can. Sometimes we extract the feature that they want, and if the client has the budget, we do have to go in and code that extra bit of functionality that they're expecting from this plugin and do on our own. So this last client that we did, we had three plugins that were not compatible, but it was one of those cases where the client says, yeah, I need 10% of the 100 features of this plugin offers. That's why I installed it. And so we, it was easy for us to extract all those different 10% of all these plugins and create our own. And so with that, we completely eliminated the um, um, the necessity for the compatibility mode. Um, and so post meta reduced. I was actually looking while we were talking to the real number of how many records I had in post meta, and it was actually 15 million lines. <laughs> I don't know how big the database. I've never saw the size of it because I, I. Who cares if it's 10 giga, 20 giga? It's it's enormous. It's like. It comes to a point where you don't really care how, how big it is. Um, it's this in this case the client is paying for whatever space is needed. The, it increases the cost of the hosting, it, so it's auto expanding. Obviously, this is a concern for the client as well. It will come as a benefit to not have to to expand for space and and the backup as you were saying before. But it does um, provide performance um, uh, improvement. So it then reduces, it has been reduced to 4 million lines or 3 million lines. And we're talking about a website which is in operation with WooCommerce since version 2.6, 2016. So it's been almost, it's been 
eight years uh, in operation. So you can imagine like how much um, uh, ancient uh, or antique um, data it has and, and ways to store information and how difficult that should have been or more difficult than it was. It was actually very smooth. And the whole, the whole experience that we had converting all those orders, I mean, I haven't checked orders from 2016 and 2018 if the old information is there, but really I don't think anybody cares. As long as we reduce the database, the performance gets better. And let's say the most recent five, six, seven years are there for people to go back and, and consult. That's that's what matters. And it so in my case, the cleanup then after moving everything to these custom tables, the cleanup was also done in batches. But then when I was confident that the post matter was getting cleaned, the Orders were still on the back end. The orders were still on the front end. So everything was cool. I just executed all of them and we, we got a much cleaner database. And that's that's very, very good when, when we get to that point. Yeah. Did you have any monitoring enabled? Like I have one client um, yeah, that, that, is, that we have New Relic enabled. And so we're timing, you know, we're, we're collecting the data and uh, yeah, query time for the heaviest database query so we can and the overall processing time from PHP and MySQL so that we can actually see the the measurable difference, right? Because if you the the savvy store owners know that you know performance equals money and if you can reduce that processing time by just 20%, right? Like that means checkout's gonna get faster, adding to cart, um, etc. Um, if you're so it's yeah I'm curious if did this store owner has anything like that. So in this particular case, we do have the ability to monitor that, but we we did not monitor before we converted um, because um, the the main concern there was to improve performance overall. It was not specifically for HBOS. It was was a component of a whole project. So it was more about fixing HTML stuff on the front end that was um, um, yeah just causing some CLS issues. It was causing some other performance issues. And and the uh, project was more about getting the performance better and a small part of it, maybe a big part of it, it was not measured, it was an HBOS. So what we're going to do now is, the story is actually going to go live this week. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to monitor for long running queries on the database. And we're going to monitor a little bit more about other stuff as well. And so I will have the comparison. The client in this case is not waiting or not expecting for this was before, this was after in terms of the database. It is more expecting. Uh, we monitored how the loading time uh, was before we did the change and how loading time will be now. And so we will measure that the website did take five, six seconds to fully load uh, in the previous version. And it's now taking less than one second. So you as an expert in this area can imagine how how much that will affect sales. And and so we're just expecting that. As long as the client sees more sales, um, obviously for me, it would be very interesting to measure exactly. So 16 gigabytes of database reduced to four gigabytes of database was were, was responsible for 40% of the, the speed of the improvement. And unfortunately, we don't have that data. We were just heads down trying to get everything done and not not focused on that, maybe on the next project. I know that you do that a lot. You like to collect all of those data that will serve you for the next client. Show, hey, I had this client, it went from here to here. And that is super important, actually. But that's maybe more for a performance um, dev talk later. Um, <laughs> if, if Bob wants says again and, and likes as talking on, on the podcast. But um, the database thing uh, is definitely going to contribute to their overall performance. And like I said, the there's a third parties connecting the API and collecting information as well. So it, all of that will, will get a lot of benefit. Avalara wants to make sure that your projects go smooth. And part of that includes doing it right with their API. Their resources cover it all to help your clients manage sales and use, excise, GST, VAT, and other tax types across the U.S. and abroad. You'll find it all on their site, and you'll be learning more on how they can help you during their sponsorship of Woo Dev Chat. Want to learn more? Just go to developer.avalera.com. So for me, the most difficult part was to sell this to clients, right? So 
you had clients that were coming in and saying, yeah, sure, let's um, let's do that. How much will that cost me? And I said, well, first we have to do a discovery and then we have to download the, the database. We have to play around with it on our local install. And um, yeah, and then we will get to a point where we know which plugins are incompatible and then we need to fix the plugins and then we need to run it. And then I realized that's not what the client wants to hear. Right? It's just <laughs> problems after problems after problems after problems. And then they, okay, never mind. I really actually don't want to hear anymore how much this will cost, but it sounds very expensive. So I don't want to do that. Um, what do you think would be your approach or um, would you split into different phases? Would you tell them up front, um, maybe it's not possible, I'll do it on my best. Uh, what What is your approach when you... Um, work with clients like that that come to you and say, hey, I want HBOS activated? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question because it's hard for, I think, human beings in general to make decisions on something that will take a lot of resources and energy when there's not enough pain or desire, right? So I think probably you're, you know, the client that you were talking about before, he was more focused on front end performance, right? There's like six seconds. I know that's taking a long time. You know, the, the LCP element, the, the largest contemporary paint, that big, beautiful, right. like header or image, um, you know, but when that's slower, it means you're usually making less money. So um, that makes sense that you were measuring the front end because you probably didn't have a lot of pain in the back end would be my guess, right? So when, you know, if you don't have a lot of um, employees, you know, some people have, five employees like processing orders constantly and that's hammering the database a lot and if they're waiting several minutes for things to complete that's a lot of pain and you feels like you're paying employees to sort of sit around and wait um whereas so if he didn't have those kind of complaints it makes sense that that's not the focus of the the measurement right whereas on the front end if he's like oh it feels if he was experiencing when he's browsing around on the site um in the browser you know trying to add to cart and do stuff and he's like oh like this is taking too long that's what you know, he's going to be focusing on and ask you to fix and measure before and after to make sure it's like a good insurance policy, right? To be like, hey, look, I have the numbers. Like, this is what it was like before. This is what it was like after. Right, right. People can quickly get amnesia, I've, I've noticed. So, um, yeah, like if you don't have the, if the cl client isn't experiencing anything painful with regards to speed or uh, maybe plugins not being compatible, something like that, then selling it to them is kind of like it's invisible progress to them is what I call it. Like it's, it's, it's an invisible improvement because they don't, if it's not, a, if it's a small store where they're not going to feel the benefits of, of HPOS, you know, um, migration from, from a database uh, query perspective, like, you know, if it goes from 500 milliseconds down to like, you know, 100, it's not, it's probably something they're going to feel super um, intensely. So it's, yeah, you I, I you try to use analogies of like houses or something relatable for people to understand. Like uh, just like you mentioned, when you start a new store now, it's like, hey, let's enable HPOS from the get go. Um, and it's it's a good analogy to be like, oh, if you're building a house and you know how that house should be built for the purposes that that house is going to have. And it's going to be your family house, like for, for the next 40 years or 50 years, right? Oh, you go. Yeah. So you're going to make sure there's space for like the pool, the playground or, you know, fire pit, whatever stuff your family likes to do. Like you're going to account for all of that ahead of time. You're not going to just buy a plot of land and start building away. Yeah. yeah just start building randomly. You know, you get something from um, whatever construction place to start putting it together without having some kind of, yeah, plan to make sure it's executed well. And when when people start to, you know, like the foundation of a house, for example, right? Like that needs to be changed once in a while. Your car, right? Like it has to be maintained and, um, you know, the engine has to be uh, whatever, tuned up and all that stuff. So things like that, t clients tend to have a bit more like, oh, like I know what happens if I neglect, if I don't take my car to the mechanic every once in a while, right? Like, you uh, because it, it, a car and a website have a lot of things in common. Like we expect it to just do what it's supposed to do, right? Like I bought it and it's supposed to do this thing forever. Like I keep putting fuel in it. In this case, you keep giving it internet server resources. It's supposed to just keep doing that thing forever, but. And not ever break. Yeah. 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 Not ever break. Right. And it's like, well, 
things need to be, you know, you need to tighten some screws and bolts here. You know, you might need to replace a part or upgrade a part because it got worn out because of excessive use. And so I think when those are, those are the markers of a, of a reasonable and good client for me too, when they can take these on board and be like, okay, like I get that you're not just trying to take my money or do unnecessary work. Like we have the best interests of the client at, at heart. And, um, you know, our goal is to help them succeed for the, the duration of their store's life, right? So however we can do that and communicate to them, like this is, you know, for the longevity of your uh, store's life and so that it's going to perform well, be easy to maintain and have less headaches and nonsense going forward that could be avoided if you go through this like slightly painful, you know, might feel like a waste, quote unquote, of, of money to them. But it's like, it's like an insurance policy, I think, going forward to get this stuff done um, properly and earlier. And then on the other hand, you have those clients who um, have really problematic websites and they're desperate. And those are actually very a lot easier to, to sell this to them. And, and again, we're not trying to impose them something that is just means for us running a couple of um, command lines and, and just doing some work, repeated work that we know uh, what we should do and, and how it gets done and, and just earn some good money with it. That's not absolutely not the point. The point is really take um, make this website work in a way that it's supposed to work from the beginning, right? Because saving data in post matter was never intended to be like that. It was just the resources that were available when, when the, the plugin was created and, when people realize this is not the best way to save data, well, they probably knew from the beginning, but this is not the best way to to save it. Let's change it. Oh, wait a minute. We have 1 million installs. We have a problem in our hands. How are we going to do this, right? So it was definitely too late when they realized, and, and there were a bunch of people working on different solutions for that. And um, I did some stuff back in the day, 2016, 17, where we did do a plugin where... We just basically created a custom or multiple custom tables for everything and it was related to products, customers, and orders. It was a lot more primitive than today's proposal and what we can get with HBOS. But we did find that we had the need to create something back then to help the client have a better experience and and the, the client's customer to have better experience on the website. So we created this thing. That was done later, bought by iThemes. It was called, it was called Sales Accelerator, and it, it did have a bunch of data stored in different ways in tables. But the the main goal of that was to create a good analytics, right? Some good records that it could go back and analyze numbers and and collect information about how sales are doing, average sales orders, how the most spending customers, um, the less sold products. Um, all of that, right? It was very difficult to collect that information from post meta and the number of inner joins and 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 all of the parameters. And then he had to query in the post meta and and the keys and values and all of that. It was for us developers and experts and programmers looking at that code at that SQL queries. I think I think it would be actually a good Netflix show to show them queries and see how long they would take to figure out without touching any keyboard what that query would do. Because they were so unreadable and so difficult to, uh, yeah, just to, to generate them and make them work, right? Um, and so now that we have HBOS and what we did back in the days as well was just we collected a lot of statistical data while we were creating the orders, right? So it makes a lot more sense while the order is being done and created and data is being collected that you do some calculations ahead and store the result on the table, right? And then later on, if you want to consult that information, it's a lot easier. You don't have to do all the sum before you do the statistical data. Everything is already there. So right now, uh, on the current solution, you do have a, a WooCommerce table that is called, I was trying to figure it out, but it's it ends with uh, underscore analytics, underscore records. I can't remember exactly, but we have a special table now dedicated to information about total sales, about net sales, about customers and all of that. So it is a lot easier. So my point coming forward now will be, yeah, you maybe won't get a lot faster website. It won't be that much visible of a result. 
but you get new analytics tools and you get a lot of information that you can collect about your customer that would probably uh, harm your website's performance while you were looking for that data, right? You, we must remember that whatever work you're doing on the back end, unless you have a very, very good uh, hosting service, whatever long uh, running query you have on the back end is also going to affect the front end, right? So you have customers visiting your website. You don't want to collect information, statistical information, and having this long running queries while customers are visiting your website. So that will be my selling point coming forward. Like you have a lot more information. It's a lot easier to get uh, billing, uh, shipping information and collect all of that data because I think that's that's a good selling point. That's something that the client wants to see, how well it's performing, performing and maybe also what is not working, what I need to fix, right? And so maybe we'll see some new plugins coming up that will take benefit of this and put AI on it and do recommendations for how to improve your website and sell more products and things. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point, actually. I Yeah, there's a lot of, I have a few clients who say that unless you're using metric or metoric is how it's spelled. Metoric, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, like getting uh, detailed intelligence things are very... Right. Difficult with, with WooCommerce. So it's really good to hear that they're doing this kind of um, improvements because you need insights like that to be able to take you do. intelligent action, right? So even if like they're not going to feel a huge performance, you know, which is one of the, that's how it's been sold, um, right? The, to the community, I think it's like, oh, it's going to fix this and clean up the database, but giving these extra bonus features of, you know, data intelligence is super super valuable so did, did these things used to be generated by like sql some sort of thing on the on the fly if you wanted to generate something like this before okay yeah so now it's just done with php on the fly and then stored in as a value in the database instead correct exactly and and even total sales or or if you have an order with 30 lines or something like that you would need to sum them all up to get some some total sales as well and um I just looked up the so the table we're talking about is WC order stats. That's the one that we have information about the number of items sold, total sales, tax sales, the shipping total, net total, if it is a, rec- a returning customer or not, which is like one of probably the most valuable information ever. Um, and and then also it it um, has information about the addresses, the um, which is something like we we don't think about that much, but if you have um, customers that are doing their own uh, uh, shipment from their warehouses and, and all the invoicing and all of that, like billing and shipping information, being easy to collect them and, and being easy to extend them is, is uh, super valuable. And um, it also feels like um, the uh, – so we, you still get an orders and orders meta table, but it's not like the total amount or the billing email or – the stuff that you use more in terms of when you want to know information about an order is inside orders matter. So they've, they've divided this, like the, the most important information they think they still are recording that on the orders table. So on the main table and the orders matter has done the rest of it. Like man, many third parties, um, uh, yeah, just meta keys are stored in there and meta values and all of that. One thing that I wish would come uh, in the near future and something that I've um, observed when I was looking for ways to do that custom plugin that I talked about that would take all of that functionality from those those other plugins uh, would be for us plugin developers to register, um, yeah, just our own metadata. So you get custom tables for all the metadata that belong to WooCommerce, but you as a plugin author, if you want to have your meta metadata and you want to store your information in regards to whatever activity you do around WooCommerce, you have still to rely on the post meta, right? So if it is something that, I mean, as a plugin author, you could build your own custom table and you could be responsible for creating it and not populating post meta. You would be probably responsible developer thinking about that long-term. You want your plugin to be successful and, and to be used in, in large-scale websites. So you would probably do your own custom table. But nevertheless, there's all this in between the plugin developers who are not 
uh, thriving for the most um, sales number, and they do use post meta. And so, what I would like to see is maybe will commerce come up with a solution that um, would allow you as a plugin developer to register your own meta, and that would create either a custom table for you. It will manage that custom table, or it would be in an environment where uh, you would not use post meta somehow, some other solution, um, because. If you, if you do HBOS and, and you're happy and now install a plugin that will save three lines in the post meta because you have 500,000 orders, you go back to the old problem that you had before. Not as, as much as you had before, but it's something that it still needs to be accounted for. Um, I was just wondering if there's a way that we could warn people or if there's a, you know, if there's something that the WooCommerce core plugin could say, oh, hey, it looks like you just installed this plugin and we noticed it's doing, that probably is a big ask, but it would be, because a lot of um, you know store owners, they are always testing new features. I'm sure you see this all the time, right? They're always looking for a new toy or a new feature that will enhance the user experience or make life easier somehow. And they think, you know, oh, it's just one little plugin. You know, like all plugins are innocent until proven guilty kind of thing. And, um, yeah, like it would be nice if there was some way for people to be warned, like, Hey, this, you know, is going to get you what you want, but it's doing this thing in the database, which could give you problems in the future, especially if it's something that, you know, a lot of clients seem to just want to test things to see if, does this have legs? Is this actually going to be effective and, and help my, uh, my business, um, right. You know, goals and, Sometimes it's, you know, they try it for a month or two and then they're like, oh, like they just deactivate it and remove it or, you know, worse, don't deactivate it, leave it on, <laughs> even though it's, um, you know, they're not actually using it. And yeah, there's a, if there was a like warning labels on plugins, <laughs> it would be a very, you know, kind of like there is on, on cigarettes and like, you know, foods now, right? There's, it would be interesting to see how people would behave, probably still ignoring a lot of them anyway, but at least that would give us a chance as, as experts to be like, ah, okay, like these are the, the plugins I need to look at their code and see what they're doing in the database and see how do, am I going to clean this up um, for the client, right? So As long as those notices are not the actual notices that we have, the thousand notices on the top of each uh, page on the back end. Oh, the admin notices. <laughs> the admin notices that they will uh, ignore all the time. We <laughs> learn to ignore them for forever now. Um, I mean, there is a... Um, I don't know what happens if after a conversion you try to install a plugin that is not compatible or that the um, WooCommerce script that looks for uh, things that might not be compatible if it shows up and if it gives you some kind of error, if it even allows you to activate the plugin at all. I don't have that experience. It w- it's actually a good a good test to do before we, we do the final delivery this week. Like Try to install one of those plugins that were marked as um, incompatible while you're running high performance order storage on uh, what it does, if it allows you to even activate the plugin or not. But it's a good point. It's something that we as experts could eventually propose. We have, you know, we have this way of communicating back to the uh, WooCommerce um, developers theme that, that with, with tips and, and recommendations and whatnot. And, and, we are talking to the clients directly, right? So we know what are the problems that we are facing and why this is not getting adopted uh, on a higher rate than it is right now. And and making sure that we have clear communication about what is the issue with the plugin, why it's not working, and maybe throwing some tips on how to solve it. Or I know it's 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 very hard because there's uh, millions of plugins out there, but uh, a little bit more information and more transparency in terms of um, why that plugin is not compatible, would be not compatible, and how it behaves would take a little bit of the anxiety away from uh, shop owners and and would make our lives easier as well as experts to tell them, hey, this is the official list that is not compatible, and this plugin is not because of this, this plugin is not because of that. I also can imagine that a theme large like this needs to focus on different areas, and this would be probably one of the least... Um, interesting areas for them to focus and really give detailed information about plugin incompatibility. Um, maybe it's something that we can work on and, and try to, uh, to figure out how we can detect those kind of stuff. I mean, 
we, we have friends who work with um, security analysis uh, plugins that detect the, the most obscure and, and undetectable to the human eye things that are happening to code and, and uh, create vulnerabilities. But the same logic could be applied to this. I mean, there's a lot of techniques that we can use to scan a plugin and, and tell them what's not compatible, why it's not compatible, and where it should be fixed, right? I'm thinking of like, can I use this? Right? Can I use like equivalent, right? And then you sort of have a a mass aggregated um, thing that could collect data if people could would opt into it during you know an H H pass um, migration test, right? Like there's something. It feels like there's some possibility there to do something cool that could be really helpful for the community, right? Right. And if you if you do do this test, I'm curious about activating a plugin or trying to install a plugin that is not H pass compatible. I'd be curious if you if it doesn't if it doesn't let you activate it in the in the browser if you try doing it by a CLI if you if it lets you and then if you take it a step further editing the um, active underscore plugins <laughs> option in the, the option table and forcing it that way I really want to see um, like some kind of admin notice or like where it's just like no this is it, or it simply won't let it be enabled but I think you know you can always force things in technology um, in one way or another. And, and, and remember that this this client in particular, we're talking about a client that is not going to just go ahead and install a bunch of plugins and just first brute force install them. But this is this is not the target that we should be focusing on if you want to have a high rate adoption of HPOS, right? Those bigger clients, they have the budget, they have the understanding, they know how things work. They are they're not the ones who are problematic after the conversion and and maintaining this this all this running. We're talking about the bigger cut of all the WooCommerce users and the customers that are shop owners that built it all by themselves. They uh, don't have the time or the money to spend on experts. And so from when adopting HPOS, they should be somewhat provided with tools that enable them to make the right choices afterwards, right? So, and not mess everything up again. It's very easy to just give up and go back to whatever comfortable situation we had before. And and so that's what we want to do. We want to really make sure that we we provide them with tools that they know about why it's not possible to install that or work with that. And so that's definitely something that we need to do. But I don't know any can I use uh, website related information in regards to this particular subject out there. Maybe I'm not one hundred percent knowledgeable about that. But um, the um, that should be a thing that for for the listeners to maybe uh, chime in and. I'm not sure if there's any comment section or anything like that in the podcast, but yeah, just reach out and, and let us know if you found something in regards to how we can test if plugins are comp- compatible or not. The whole thing is about making the customer, our customer, so the shop owner feel comfortable about when we're doing, going to do this this conversion. And now it's the time to do it. This is also something I wanted to use the podcast to just let everybody know. We work... Um, in this community and platform called Codable. Um, Codable, we have a lot of experts working with WooCommerce websites and we have very knowledgeable people there. Uh, special shout out to uh, Edith. Um, she uh, has been talking about HBOS for a couple of years now and she is really pushing forward every small to big client and all experts to feel comfortable about this. It seems like at the beginning when this was there, there were some hiccups, there were some problems, some issues. I can guarantee now if I can um, adopt a HPOS in a web store that uh, was launched in 2016 and has 18 million lines in the post meta and 80%, 90% of them are related to orders. And if that worked, um, the reasons why they should not work on other websites could only be because of very niche client, niche plugins that client needs to install to solve very specific problems that are probably not actually the solution to their problem at all, right? And the, the, the cool thing about Codable too is we have, you know, we have Slack channels where we all share information. We share the, the you know, challenges that we're facing with client stuff and the solutions and working together. It's a beautiful community and a lot of really smart people there who are very tenacious and really, you know, almost uh, compulsive problem solvers, right? Like we want, we want the answer, we want the solution. And it's, uh, you know, being able to share that with, with others and help us help clients be happier and have a better life is just super rewarding, right? So definitely a good place to go if you need 
to find someone who knows what they're doing or will at least do their very best to make sure they know what they're doing, right? So, Right. And as you said, if they don't know 100%, they're not going to do it. They're going to ask other people within our community. And from all the 700-something people that are, that are on the platform, two, three, four of them will have an experience with that and will let you know about how it went and how it's supposed to go. So definitely uh, super, uh, super interesting to to go there and, and take a look at that. I was I was trying to stall this like last minute that we have on our on our end to uh, actually activate a plugin that we um, um, marked as incompatible after our conversion. So I'm just gonna click on activate and we're gonna see almost live what is gonna happen to the website and uh, we're gonna get our answer in. 10 seconds, I would say. <laughs> <On sessions. laughs> Live demos always go well, right? Like blue screen of death for Bill Gates. And- right. <laughs> but no one can see your screen, so maybe that removes the, the curse. Okay, so it, it did let me activate, but there's a big notice, an admin notice. Uh, go figure. Okay. And it, has, it has detected some of your active plugins are incompatible with the currently enabled WooCommerce features. Please review the details. So it's not prohibiting you to activate it, but it's definitely signaling that they are uh, not compatible. And then if you go to um, um, click on the link that it has on the notice, it goes to the plugins um, list and it has a new filter called incompatible with WooCommerce features. And then it enumerates all the plugins that are active and and incompatible with, with the features. Obviously they're telling features here. We're not 100% sure what they mean. But this only showed up when I activated HBoss. So again, this goes back to transparency, right? It should be like very clear, say this is not HBoss compatible. And this is why it's not HBoss compatible. I, I would like to see that in the future at some time. Yeah, I, I wonder if there'll be a new setting eventually too to like prohibit the activation, you know, where it's sort of like a fail safe, like, hey, don't don't let people enable plugins that are HPOS uh, incompatible. Right. I think that could be a nice thing. And I, I was just thinking about the can I use thing. Like I'm thinking about the amount of server resources that gets get used for scanning incompatibilities because it's looking at the PHP code, right? Is what I'm assuming, right? And if that was like if you could instead like export your plugin list and submit it to, you know, a can I use WooCommerce equivalent, it could just spit out that report for you instead of having to do a lot of um, calculations and scanning. There's uh, that conference that we went to, right? The uh, Perf. Perf now? So, yeah, Perf now in Amsterdam. They were talking about the like eco friendliness of performance because power, um, you know, it requires energy and that uses, um, yeah, it uses like not necessarily clean energy, right? So it's a good thing for the planet potentially as well to be using these kind of um, alternatives. As a last comment, I just wanted to take a little bit back what I just said before, that they are not clear about which one is HPOS incompatible. Actually, if you browse through the list of plugins, there is a small new um, warning saying this plugin is incompatible with the enable featured high performance order storage. It, should be, it shouldn't be active. So it lets you activate. It warns you it shouldn't be active. It's sort of like saying, now deal with the consequences, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not a good solution. <laughs> uh, do you want the notice to like blink yellow and be more apparent? I'm not seeing what it is like on, on your side. It, it is a yellow note. It's like the same shape that you have when you ha- when there is a new version of something and here's a link to update on the plugins list. You know, when you have this like little red icon saying there's a new version of so and so such and such plugin, it's the same kind of notice. It's it, oh, That's why I didn't see it while I was talking about this before. It, it sort of like blends in with the rest, and many many of the the shop owners are really used to see a bunch of yellow warnings on the plugins list, and they never click to update, or most of the time they do not update it. So it kind of blends in with the rest. Um, definitely something to be uh, improved there. We don't want our cl- our clients after they've paid us a bunch of money to activate HBoss to have issues and come back to say oh, our orders are not in sync or we're missing information or something like that. So, uh, but we've long come. We've we have come a long way, and HBoss is to be installed everywhere. <laughs> yes, 
Yes, and definitely active for new installations, which I think that's the default, right? When you go through, it that. is, it is, it is. But um, yeah, we still have a, a yeah. That's that's good. But every everybody else, all the millions of sites and all of the billions of dollars that are made through WooCommerce websites, they need to have their information stored in a better way. And HPOS is definitely the solution for that. Cool. All right, Mike. It has been a pleasure talking to you. As always, Marcel. As always. And I think we should convince Bob to let us come again and, and talk about something else. I think this is a very interesting format, and I really love talking about this stuff, as you also do, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. So it's cool that we finally got something like this recorded. And, you know, instead of on our way to squash, like we're going tomorrow, doing a, <laughs> doing this similar thing in, in the car, right? We actually record it, and maybe we'll help some people, which is right. really cool. All right. Um, take care. Till next time. Hey, Bob WP here. And I'd like to thank Avalara.com for their support. Please consider checking them out. And again, thanks for tuning in to Woo Dev Chat. And if you're not subscribed, just visit do the woo.io forward slash subscribe or find us on your favorite pod player. And remember, you can subscribe to any of our shows directly or hear them all on our full do the Woo channel feed. And lastly, we welcome your thoughts, insights, and feedback on all of our episodes. Just head over to do the Woo.io and leave a comment. So until the next time. <laughs>